First of all, greetings to all of you who could join us this afternoon. My name is Barry Price, and I'm the current president of the Hemlock Society of San Diego. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the May 2023 meeting on when is it time to die? The Hemlock Society, for as many of you know, has been educating people on end of life issues for well over three decades. Uh, we do this primarily through bi-monthly meetings like the one we're having today, uh, as well as bi-monthly film and small group discussions that we organize at libraries in, in the San Diego area. Uh, for those of you who are not already Hemlock Society members, we encourage you to join us. Uh, you do not have to live in San Diego to be a member. Uh, we have a lot of members outside of San Diego. The membership fee, I think, is very reasonable. It's only $35 a year. Uh, and you can join the membership or simply learn about future events by going to our website at hemlocksocietysandiego.org. Uh, we have a large audience today, so it is uh, very important that our guests keep their mics muted while the program participants are speaking. Uh, audience members will be able to submit questions to the Zoom chat line at any time during the presentation. And then at the end of the presentations by all three participants, we'll read those questions off the chat line. Uh, and hopefully you'll be able to get your your question in uh, if you want to ask somebody. Try and identify who you'd like to answer the question, if you could as well, when you put that information in the chat line. Finally, um, because we have a pretty tight timeline, we've assigned Faye Gersh, our uh, organization's founder, to be the timekeeper today. So she's going to try and keep our speakers on target uh, and so that all of them have an opportunity to get their, uh, their thoughts into the discussion. Um, lastly, at three o'clock, we officially end the meeting uh, and we want to do a couple things right at the end of the meeting. First of all, we want to post one quick poll question that asks you about how you found out about this uh, meeting, just for our own information. And then we also want to take a minute to, or two to show the slides, the biographical slides of each of our program participants, because they have a lot of information we can't get across in, 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 in the program, but you might wanna see that information and you might wanna have some information you can use to contact them. So we'll put those biographical slides up at the end of the program as well. Um, and I guess since uh, the coordinator of today's program is Lee Hill, who's a board member of Hemlock and, and, and has done all the footwork in putting this program together, uh, I'll let Lee uh, introduce the speakers and get us started. Lee? Thank you very much, Barry. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for being here for today's topic, When Is It Time to Die? After you've heard from our panel of experts and your questions have been answered, it's our hope that you're better equipped to plan your death and can plan it in a way that improves lives, more lives than just your own. We have three end of life experts to help us explore the questions, what makes my life worth living? When is it? time to begin the dying process, and how do I prepare my end of life team? For the purposes of today's presentation, we describe the dying process as all curative treatment being refused and no further action being taken to either sustain or prolong life. This is a two-part presentation. Part one will focus on how to determine when quality of life is acceptable and when it is not. And part two will focus on how to select and prepare an end of life team. Our expert panelists include Gabrielle Elise Jimenez. She is a hospice nurse, end of life doula, and conscious dying educator. Gabby is the author of four books and the creator of the blog titled The Hospice Heart. Dr. Stanley A. Terman is a bioethicist and psychiatrist medical director of Caring Advocates, and author of three advanced care planning books. Dr. Terman is the creator of the My Way Cards, which, are, which create a living will, especially for, but not exclusively for, advanced dementia. And finally, William Simmons is a Hemlock Society of San Diego advisor and former board member and a retired lawyer who has been involved in, in end of life issues for more than 15 years. Bill is the creator of an advanced directive unique 
in that it is brief and expands on choices not usually found in advanced directives. Bill is also, has also created the lecture series, Life Sunset Plan Before the Sun Goes Down. We'll begin part one, examining quality of life with Gabrielle Jimenez. Gabby, when is it time to die? Oh, that's a pretty big question. And I think it could be answered in so many different ways. So I think I'll start with just from my experience and the work that I do as a end of life doula and a hospice nurse, the thing that I witness most at the end of life is, is regret and wishing that they had done things differently or spent time doing things differently or saying more things. And it's definitely me, made me or helped me to move forward in a, a whole different light and to maybe savor life a little bit more. So when I think about when is it time to die? When is it a, when are you ready to let go? I think the first thing you wanna do is question who you are. What's your story? What, what have you done? What are you most proud of? I do this thing a lot of times with my patients and clients, and I ask them, I do this thing called the this is me list. And it's this opportunity to help me to get to know them. But what if we did a this is me list early on? right? Maybe in our early 20s, or, or now I'm almost 60, even now when I am actually very healthy, who am I? What have I done? And I question that all the time. I think, what am I going to be remembered for? What is my legacy? I have two grown children and two grandchildren. I want to live a life that would leave them telling my story long after I'm gone. Now, if given the luxury of time, right? We're healthy, we're strong right now, and we have the time. I want to, I ask myself, what could I do differently? What could I do more of? And I think if you can answer those questions, if you can go to that deep place within that says, am I at peace with who I am and the contribution that I have made in my world, in my life, for my family, for my friends? Have I done something, even in the tiniest amount that is significant enough to allow my story to continue to be told? Then I feel like I could be ready. I could make peace with that time coming. Now, I'm not in any way ready to die yet. And so because I feel at least today, right this moment, that I do have the luxury of time, at least today, it makes me think about the things that I want to do differently or more of. I, I want to reach out to the people I love, maybe those I haven't talked to in a while, and not because we've had disconnect or arguments, but because time has taken on a life of its own and we've sort of lost contact. I want to reach out to them. And, and I want to do more things that allow me to savor the gifts that life has blessed me, right? Just natural things like, like just the things that mother nature, I want to hike more, I want to travel more. And, and some people don't have the funds to do that. So what if you just make right now matter? What if you have deep conversations? What if you share who you are with the people that you love? What if you take time right now to make peace with that? And if you aren't in that position, if there's things that you haven't done yet and things that you still need to do or want to do, what if you did them now? Now, when I die, I this is just me, but I don't want to have regret. I, I don't want to have unfinished business. My brother died last year. And this is after three years of complete and total disconnect. We hadn't talked. And this is after we had had a really great relationship. Things happen, right? That's just life. We all have things happen. But time, it's fragile. It's, it's unpredictable. And it's precious. And it's a gift. We spend so much time thinking about doing things tomorrow or next week or, oh, I'll do that another time. But you are not guaranteed that. So for me, when I was sitting at that bedside with my brother, all I could think about was all the time I've wasted. And if I could do anything differently, 
it would have been to let that anger go, to not carry that with me, to have maybe had more time and spent more time making more memories that I could take with me because his life was taken way too short and completely unpredictably. Now, as a hospice nurse, I always tell people, they hear what you're saying when you're at the bedside. Now, I believe that. I've always believed that. I wasn't making that up, but I, I just trusted that I was right. Now, I was at the bedside with my brother, and every day for 18 days, I told him how much I, I missed him, how I wished we hadn't wasted so much time. I said, when you get out of here, Ben, we're going to do things differently. We're going to do things better. I accepted his nonverbal apologies, which I'm going to assume he was giving me. And I, I, I gave him my own, and I forgave him, and I asked for forgiveness. Now, he woke up one day. And on that day, they removed the ventilator and he was talking and he said to me, oh, I said to him, Ben, did you hear me? And he said, yes. And he said, I'm sorry, too. Now, he said that because he thought he was going to live, not because he thought he was going to die. But what that tells me is he heard me. And we assume that they can't, but we also wait till the bedside to say the things. In order to leave this life, whether it's by age, decline naturally, or by diagnosis and the disease process, or even tragedy. I want to leave this life feeling less regret and, and knowing that I've said the things. And by that, I mean truly savoring with almost a childlike enthusiasm the life that I am gifted. So in order to be able to leave, I think we need to resolve a few things. And maybe you can't resolve, but what if you learn to let it go? What if you stop carrying that weight with you, right? I think that's when you know that you can leave with a sense of peace in your heart. In my classes, I talk a lot about the coat of many pockets. Each pocket, now imagine you're wearing this, right? You've got this trench coat and there's a hundred pockets and each pocket is filled with mud. All of that mud is all of the things you wish you hadn't done or said, or all the things that's gotten in your way, maybe moments that you got angry for no reason, or things that you can't take back. Now, we as, as intelligent human beings, we know we can just take that jacket off, but oh no, we don't do that. We walk around life carrying this jacket, splashing mud everywhere we go, and it gets in our way, and it's heavy, and, and we can't walk really well. But what if we started emptying that mud? Now I have a whole lifetime of things that I wish I could have said and done differently. And I know I can't go back. So what I've been trying to do is let it go to make peace with it because I don't wanna take that with me when I die. Now, of course I'm a hospice nurse, right? So I question my mortality every single day. I get in the car and I question my mortality. I'm faced with it more often than most people. And so that makes things a little harder, of course, because I'm, I'm always thinking about that. But what if, and this is what I'm going to leave you with, what if we simply lived a life that made us feel proud of who we are and the contribution we make in the world, even if it's just a small little bit, that we're authentic, that we're honest, that we're kind, and that when we go, whenever that may be, people will say, wow, she made a difference in this world, and I'm really glad I knew her. That's the kind of life I live. And, and, and I'm doing that now. And my pockets are, are so much less. Now I still walk around in the jacket. I, I'm kind of used to it now. We're really good friends. But, but the pockets are emptier. And I, I savor things like the clouds or the ocean or the forest or my grandchildren. And every single moment I get to spend with someone I love. And I'm thankful and I'm filled with gratitude. Now, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. I have a lot more left to do. But if this was it, if this was my last day, I'd be okay to let go. And I'd be okay to die because I know I've made peace in my heart. And I've done the very best that I could. And I've lived my life the very best that I could with everything that I was gifted. So my message to you as far as when are you going to be ready? Well, we can't really be ready but we can practice to live a life that we would be proud of and, and to ensure that our story never stops being told. 
and Gabby, th thank you so much for that. And um, when when you're with patients, um, do you, can you give us some insight on how they determine when or if it's time to give up on curative treatment and when to begin the dying process? Absolutely. I think, you know, that's a hard decision and it's a very brave decision. I think it's about quality of life. So they can do this curative treatment, right? But is it going to change things? Is it going to get in the way of them savoring their last few moments, however that is gifted to them with the people that they love? Many times the curative treatments are causing them equally as much distress or difficulty without. I mean, it's it's a hard thing to predict or even answer, but I think at the end of the day, I think you have to decide what is more important to you, that you can be Co, you know, aware of your conversations and the people that are in your life and to be able to be present with the moment. And, and, and to know that, again, you've made peace with your life and who you are and, and the contribution you've made in it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Anything else, Gabby? Um, Time's no. up. My time's Time's up. up. Time's up. There you go. So up next on examining quality of life is Dr. Stan Terman. Dr. Terman. Thank you. First, to comment uh, how uh, poignant and meaningful and really lovely uh, Gabby's uh, presentation was. And uh, I'm going to concentrate on making decisions as uh, one of the people in the chat room decided. And at two times, there's how do you decide now and how do you decide in advance when would be the best for you? And before I start my specific presentation, I want to give some general thoughts about when. Um, so this is uh, Lisette Nigo, and uh, uh, she uh, behaved in a way at the end of her life that inspired me over the last couple of days to write a poem that may sound more like a nursery rhyme, although it's more appropriate for nursery for nursing homes. Um, Mademoiselle Lisette Nigo had two reasons to end her life. Her journey seemed complete, and fear of losing control caused her strife. But when she pondered would be the right time. She'd always shunned an age commencing with eight. So two weeks before the end of her 70s, she swallowed pills to cease her moral plight. In other words, she just didn't want to be 80. And she was healthy. And this alarmed people, including the Prime Minister of Australia. It was written up a lot. And uh, but the finger started pointing at Philip Nitschke because he had done a film with her called The Mademoiselle and the Doctor. Um, so that's one, one when which we should try to avoid. Then there's Brit Michael Irwin, who founded SOARS, which is the Society for Old Age Rational Suicide. They changed the name, but not the when, which included incurable, intolerable suffering. You did not have to be terminally ill. So I have a question, and we may have a, a, a raising of the hands. Would you want to die if you reached a stage of dementia where you no longer could read or understand newspapers or financial records such as a checkbook? Would that be sufficient criterion criteria for you to want to die? And so let's see just a uh, yes, everybody raises their hands. And if it's a no, just keep your hands by your sides. And I see some yeses, but I can't see them all. This is actually an excerpt from uh, a living will that was published by uh, my colleague, a legal scholar, Norman Cantor. Um, and if you want to check out his work, that's how to do it. And now you can start the timer because I'm going to begin my specific presentation which is traditional advanced care planning may not work. So consider a secular heretics innovative strategic protocol. And I've been at this for a little while. A secular heret heretic is a person who holds opinions about ideas, principles, or practices that differ from those that are currently widely accepted, conventional, or established. And in this presentation, you'll see two asterisks. What is the traditional? The patient's 
Self-Determination Act of 1990 lets you complete a living will that requests in advance what treatment you do or do not want if you reach specific future conditions and appoint a proxy agent to speak for you by giving healthcare instructions based on their substituted judgment. They use your their working brain and their knowledge of your lifelong values and treatment preferences given the condition that you're currently in. That's what we call substituted judgment. Both number one and number two are problematic, especially for dementia. So why is advanced care planning so challenging for advanced dementia? Why is it so hard to say when and to have that fulfilled? Here's a hint. And the challenge is there is no often, very often, no plug to pull. Sustaining the patient's life does not depend upon medical technology that can be withheld or withdrawn to allow a natural death. I did an extensive literature review of advanced directives. And I concluded, and I shared this with my friends who edited the, my colleagues who edited their comments, Carl Steinberg and Nate Heinemann, advanced directives by themselves are merely weak requests for conditional future treatment that may not succeed, especially if patients like those reaching advanced dementia need a controversial intervention such as cease assisted oral feeding. That paper was published in a prominent medical uh, ethics journal, International Biomed Central, flaws in advanced directives that request withdrawing assisted feeding in late stage dementia may cause premature or prolonged dying. So the point is that even if a living will is close to ideal by being specific, clear and convincing and comprehensive, and it authentically reflects patients' lifelong values and treatment preferences, it still may not succeed unless the proxy agent can persuade the treating physician to write the needed order and strategies that are in, that need to be in place to prevent the sabotage of that order to cease assisted feeding. Success requires strategies. I did another extensive literature review, and I concluded that uh, asking surrogates to ex express their substituted judgment should be abandoned. The evidence was abundant. The practice cannot be expected to facilitate patients attaining goal concordant care, which is the holy grail of advanced care planning. So let me give you a clinical case report with two examples of what can go wrong. An 84-year-old woman received the diagnosis of dementia eight years ago, and she now has a condition for which her living will expresses her judgment it would cause me irreversible, severe suffering. That is the when. She needs the order, cease assisted oral feeding, to be allowed to die. Her daughter, proxy agent, gives consistent instructions, but the memory unit's physicians and administrators refuse to honor this controversial order. Opponents present formidable challenges. That's number one, what can go wrong. So she continues to receive assisted feeding and hydrating. Five months later, she develops a productive cough, fever, shortness of breath, and at a meeting, everyone's on board, no antibiotics, only comfort care. But late one night, her religious sister sneaks in, calls 911, demands that she be the patient be transferred to the hospital, where she, the sister acts as a surrogate decision maker, proxy agent, on the fly and signs a new pulse for full treatment and tube feeding. Definitely opposed to what the patient wanted in her living will. So instead of dying in several days, the patient is forced to endure three more years of prolonged suffering. In my opinion, this second what can go wrong is committing fraud because the sister knew what the patient wanted and ordered something different. So how can such violations of patient's wishes be prevented? Answer, if you will accept it, or consider it, it's by implementing a set of strategies which are the subject of these following articles. So I don't expect you to read the titles right now, but I have a, a pipeline of eight articles in a book that's coming soon. Uh, three of them have been published or accepted. 
two are under uh, this, uh, review and so on. So uh, you can re you'll get a flavor for what I'm trying to do when you read the titles of these um, articles. I consider there to be two whens. When can the patient expect to die? For instance, if the UC assisted feeding, patients die of medical dehydration and generally die within two weeks. And when to implement this intervention in the first place. And for that, I use a sole criterion of severe irreversible suffering. Now, an example of some uh, challenge. AMDA, also known as the Society for Post-Acute and Long-Term Care Medicine, is a very prominent national organization. Their 5,000 healthcare providers provide long-term care in facilities. And what they did in 2019, and it lasted until 2023, was to adopt a policy of comfort feeding, always for all nursing and assisted living facility residents, including memory units for advanced dementia, and listen to these words, despite any advanced directives to the contrary. They were paternalistic and they blatantly ignored patients' wishes. So we have to counter that. And my program is called Strategic Advanced Care Planning and it's designed to help patients living with advanced dementia and other terminal illnesses avoid being forced to endure prolonged dying that is often accompanied by severe suffering. And now I'm gonna get into how does the advanced care planning of the strategic mode work. Task one is to complete a set of my way cards which are illustrated and readable at the third grade level of comprehension. And the reason for that is so that early stage dementia patients can use them to complete a natural dying living will. I created this initially in 2009 and this program has been revised just about every two years. The cards reflect a broadened view of suffering, including suffering that cannot be contemporaneously observed in patients. And I'm gonna illustrate that. When people take the My Way Card program, they are asked to judge each of 50 conditions one at a time. And you will notice that these three questions com are compatible with the pulsed. Would it cause no suffering? Full treatment. Would it cause moderate suffering? Selective treatment. And by the way, living wills are not just for end of life. They also are when you only want selective treatment. You don't want to go to the ICU, or you might even want to give up uh, any curative treatment, as Stan, we were talking three about. Minutes, three minutes, Stan. Severe suffering, um, comfort care. Okay. So uh, I, I'm going to need more than three minutes, Faye. Very commonly on... Uh, advanced directives, neither patient, the patient cannot recognize their family members or close friends, but that does not necessarily mean they're suffering. They are severe enough suffering in this on the left, where there's a frustration and no response from the patient. But on the right, the patient who also can rec cannot recognize these nice people is engaged in singing along as others dance and so on. I, if there's time, I can come back to these others, but let me say, for example, in the lower right, 1.2. I didn't realize, I, I, I don't know if you gave me credit for the general introduction, Faye, but I, was told I cannot to recall or understand or talk about my roles. I have been a spouse, close friend, and parent, and so forth. This is a non-observable dis uh, disruption of life narrative. Now, in this particular illustration, the patient is proud of the watercolor or finger painting that she's sharing with her former high-level business associate. But she may be suffering later on, and then this would be taken into consideration. So another set of um, uh, My Way cards, we forget that we're, patients forget they're married, they get into bed with someone else at the nursing home, the indignity of changing diapers, the exhaustion and financial uh, problems that uh, befall their uh, and, and their loved ones. And so often I see that the motivation 
for getting a good advanced care planning is not so they won't suffer. Yes, that's that's important, but so that their loved ones don't suffer. Stand one minute, and we do have two other one other speaker. So, we oh, okay, do all right. Uh, many people uh, complete advanced. So basically, what I do is, um, if I have one minute, I want to talk to you about Future Pulse, which have the following: first, follow these orders, then contract contact the physician, which leaves no opportunity for a conflict to emerge. No justification is required. And the law says that other states shall follow the pulse and the orders in pulse. So compared to a, a, an advanced care planning, uh, all, all a directive can do is say, please, it's just a request. But it's heretical because pulse are generally designed for people who are frail, seriously, or, or terminally ill. And I promote and recommend that they be considered as completed as future pulse during advanced care planning. And but, thank you. Time is up. It's been very, very informative. We can go back to this a little bit later. Yes, yes. Just and, one thing, and that in order for the pulse to work best, you need to write on the pulse two extra orders. The implemented orders must be consistent with the advanced directive, the living will. And no one but the patient can consent or consign to a new pulse. And if you recall the case that I presented, this will overcome the challenges of violating the patient's wishes and committing fraud. Thank you. And this is the list of pulse that can be uh, completed. The last one is like a, an insurance for people who want to com, com, uh, die by VSED. And the sixth, fifth one is what is needed for patients with advanced dementia. I also add advanced security technology and I record everything that's relevant and all truth, said Arthur Schopenhauer, passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed, then it's violently opposed, you, and third, it's accepted as being self-evident, and that's you. where I am. Thank you, Dr. Terman. We appreciate it so much, and hopefully we'll be able to get back to this in the uh, question and answer. And also, I want to let everybody know what a pulse is if they don't. And in California, it's a physician's order for life sustaining treatment. And there are names for it in other states. And uh, we'll, we will uh, get into that a little bit longer, but I, later, but I want to make sure everybody has an idea what this signed document titled Pulsed is for. And um, with that, our final expert on selecting and I, I apologize, our final expert on examining quality of life is uh, William Simmons. Bill, go ahead. Um, I'm going to take a kind of a different approach than the prior two panelists. I'm going to take a very broad approach um, to really make clear to people what the uh, options are at one extreme and the other. And, and the simple uh, concept is you either want to shorten your life or you don't. There are many people who don't wish to ever shorten their life for religious reasons, moral reasons, or family reasons, and they would rather endure suffering than shorten their life. So that's one extreme. The other extreme, of course, are people who feel their life is complete, who feel they've done everything they want to do in their life. They've talked to everybody they wanted to talk to. They have no more uh, major goals to accomplish other than maybe some more travel. And so they, they view their life as complete and they choose to end their life. And you may think this is nonsense, but there is an organization devoted just to this concept. It's called, as you might expect, Completed Life Academy, or sorry, Initiative. Academy. Initiative. Initiative, oh, I'm sorry, thank you, Faye. The Completed Life Initiative, or just completedlife.org if you wanna look them up. They're based in New York, uh, the California doesn't have a corner on this, uh, but it's a rather interesting website, and they have 
panel discussions from time to time that I've found very interesting. So that's one way to look at a spectrum. Now, the other way to look at the spectrum of ending your life is quality of life. And I, I think Gabby kind of hit into this and what Gabby said, uh, I have a 100% agreement with, all these things need to be considered. But my approach is a, a little different. Um, so one quality of life is I want, I want to, to really be able to do what I'm doing now. For example, uh, I love to hike. And if I can't hike around the block anymore, even with a walker, then I choose to end my life. It's not an issue of pain or suffering. It's just that I'm not enjoying life anymore. So therefore, I want to end it. And I can. There are several ways to do that. At the other extreme of the quality of life is when you are in pain and you're being told that there's no more treatment left. Uh, you're just going to have to live it out. Well, that's a time when people might want to choose to end their life rather than wait it out. Um, and that becomes an issue when you're diagnosed with dementia or diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease or other diseases where you know suffering is coming. And to avoid that suffering, you may choose to end your life. So there are other choices along the spectrum of I'm healthy, but I'm going to end my life to I'm in great pain. I want to end my life. Uh, for example, one of your choices may be if I can't get out of bed and go to the bathroom, then I wish to end my life. Or if I can't hear or uh, can't see or both of those then I wish to end my life. So you can see that there is a great spectrum depending on your, well, let's put it this way. The bottom line is, what are your values? What's important to you? Choosing to end your life is a one person decision. It's your decision. It's nobody else's. Um, you might want to talk to your children and get their point of view. I think that's a great idea. Uh, family conversations I've discovered in, in my years working in the end of life issues is family discussions are more and more important than I ever thought. And the other way to, to think about what your choices might be is to think about your friends or acquaintances who've died. Did they have a good death? Was family around? Were they able to say goodbye? Or did they die in a hospital all hooked up to machines? And what choices do you have when you consider those kinds of different deaths? So it's, it's a very personal thing, but it's only important if you want to think about it and plan ahead for it. It's very important to talk to people while you can, get points of view, change your mind, talk to more people, change your mind again, uh, think more about when you can't sleep. Well, maybe my values are different than I thought they were last week. Think these things through and just realize there are a great wide variety of choices and decide whether you want to be sure you have a good death to the greatest degree possible, or whether you're willing to accept a bad death. And this all comes back to planning, planning with your family and then writing an advanced directive along the lines that, fan, that Stan has, has discussed, a very strong advanced directive. Um, and there are other cards other than Stan's. The other cards are called Go Wish cards. I teach those cards in, in my lectures. So um, think all this through. Don't listen to any one of us. It's your decision. It's your life. It's your death. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Bill. Um, we'll, we'll now continue with part two of today's presentation, selecting and preparing an end of life team. Um, Gabby Jimenez, our end of life doula and hospice nurse will get us stop started. Go ahead, Gabby. You know, I think the, um, the team is really important and, and there's a variety of different ways to go about this. Now, imagine that you've been given a diagnosis, right? And, and you, are, you, you need to con you know, determine what your, your wishes are. I am a proponent of an, an advocate for medical aid in dying. I have been present for 75 to 100 um, and witnessed people who have made that choice. That's a very powerful, brave choice to make. And it kind of plays into the topic in, in the first half of this, which is when do you know when it's right, okay to die? And I think that to, to determine whether or not you want to, how you want to end your life, which means in suffering or in comfort. And so part of the decision making process is how you see this planning, how do you see it panning out, right? If you've been given a diagnosis, would you start hospice? People think, I think people think if they talk about death and dying, it'll happen faster. So they choose not to. They don't have these conversations as openly and as honestly as I personally think they should. And my reason for that is so that the people who love you know your wishes. Now, hospice comes with a team. And, and you're given this, this option at when you've been given six months or less to live. And many people wait until it's weeks until they're about to die rather than starting earlier. My advice would always be to start early. And, and that's because it comes with a team, a team of people who can collaboratively come together to reduce symptoms and to help support you and the people you love physically, emotionally, and mentally and spiritually. Because the end of life affects us all in so many different ways. And to be able to have this team to support you is beneficial in a million different ways, but mostly so that you are attended to and cared for, but that your wishes are honored. Now, if you've been given this diagnosis and you don't have much time left and, and there is the possibility of suffering to be able to make a choice like medical aid and dying, or in California, it's called the End of Life Option Act or V said, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. These are choices that you get to make. But in order to feel, I think, safe with your decision, you have to be safe with the people you share them with. Your team is so important. I think the hospice team is a valuable resource. You have the doctor, you have the hospice nurse, you have the social worker, the chaplain, you have a home health aide and a hospice volunteer. This is a team who will fill in gaps of time that you're being seen, right? So you get to see them during the week. These are each individuals who will come to you to hear you, to listen, not to fix, but to support and validate what you have to say and to give you a safe place to talk about what it is that you need and want. Perhaps it is about ending curative treatments, which of course, to be on hospice, you have to choose to stop that anyway. But maybe you're pondering the whole decision and, and whether you made the right decision for yourself or am I making this decision for someone else because most people don't want to burden their family members. So that comes from a sort of an emotional or spiritual or mental perspective. The hospice team, and again, I said this already, but can collaboratively come together to help to support you on this journey, to help navigate symptoms, reactions, and everything that the myriad of different things that you experience. Now, I, I think that you, some of you might have already experienced this in your life, but sometimes the closest people in your life are not necessarily the ones that you can be open and honest with. And it's not because they're they're not they don't love you. It's because sometimes it's really hard for other people to sort of take in what it is that you're going through. We have a tendency of making other people's things about us. But but at the end of the day, what matters most is that you create a safe place, whether what it's the hospice team. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'm almost done here. And to create a safe place to bring in people. And I always suggest that you have at least three people so that you could express your wishes and you could tell them what it is that you want and how you want to be cared for so that you can trust them to support you and honor them at the end of your life. Thank you so much, Gabby. 
Um, next on selecting and preparing an end of life team is Dr. Stan Terman, our psychiatrist and bioethicist. Dr. Terman. Thank you again, Lee. Yeah. So the two teams and uh, one team is the, the team that makes a decision about when, which is what this uh, seminar webinar is about. And the other, which Gabby did a wonderful job that by the bedside during the medical, uh, in hospice and for particularly for people during medical dehydration, which I can't get into today, but I do, we'll do A. So first you have to select individuals carefully to be your proxy agent. Be, any individual you think is an alternate could become the currently acting proxy agent. They must agree to serve as your ardent advocate to honor the requests you expressed in your living will, even if they personally disagree with your request themselves. And I have a bilateral contract between the, the person who's completing advanced, direct, advanced care planning and every potential member of the patient decision committee. It's a contract that they must agree to. And it even includes some uh, ways in which the other members of the patient decision committee can remove them from power if, for example, they become demented or too greedy or whatever. Third, select other individuals whose input you value, but you do not want to have a vote. And they could be an attorney or a medical doctor, and they don't know you personally, but they have general knowledge. And so, or they could be, very importantly, a family member who is so so it loves you so much they could never never sign anything that uh, or agree to anything that will let you go they're just too too emotionally enmeshed fourth decide what the committee which should be between three at least three ideally five or more members what kind of a majority do you want simple unanimous everybody but one to decide on your fate only the current acting proxy agent is authorized to be the gatekeeper to select one of the new more appropriate future pulse that had been stored in an electronic registry and to engage in what's called a shared decision conversation with the treating physician where the goal is for your agent to persuade your physician to honor your wishes as you expressed in your living will. And how do you succeed? Well, Caring Advocates provides case law, ethical arguments, and you will have a document that's over 40 pages long in the Natural Dying Agreement and affidavit. And if you wish, you can get an end-of-life counselor to stand by your side and to help you argue. But the you in that sentence is your proxy agent because the, by then the, the patient will, of course, be incapacitated. And there's also ways to convince the physician that are negative for, uh, in terms of, for example, if they don't comply, they may lose their legal immunity and be sued civilly, sued for malpractice, sued for a criminal uh, battery, or have a, a, a sanction to their license. So, and if all doesn't work, then your agent needs to be able to present before an ethics committee, perhaps with help, or search for another willing provider and effect a transfer of care. One of the greatest. One minute, Stan. Yeah, that's all I need. Okay. But let me finish. Okay. One of the most problematic of conflicts is what if your living will says, now is when I want to die, but the person you have become living with advanced dementia points to the food in front of him and then to his mouth and grunts or says gimme what do you do which of the two yous should the medical profession your caregivers and everyone else listen to you can decide that ahead of time by the fourth of four choices which is called choice d where you sign a ulysses contract that's irrevocable so that you empower your proxy agent to override your incapacitated desires. And it says he's holding up the 
in the cartoon here, uh, line drawing, a, a, a page of the advanced directive in Living World that says, no, even if I clearly ask. So I'm you, really asking, thank you. <laughs> very good. And, the re and to explain why, I don't want my dying to take a long time. I don't want to risk more pain and suffering for, of other types. Thank you, Faye and Lee. Thank you very much, Dr. Terman. Um, our final expert on selecting and preparing an end-of-life team is Bill Simmons, our retired attorney. Go ahead, Bill. Yes, thank you. Uh, Stan, I'm glad to see that you've got the option of a Ulysses Clause. That's one of the options in my advanced directive on my website. Uh, Good. Again, I'm going to look at the whole issue of team in a broad perspective. Uh, and, and you really can't answer the question is who should be on my team so you know the specifics of the exact situation at which you are at. So the variables, the major variables are how sick are you? Uh, what method have you chosen to end your life? And a lesser third variable if you're in an institution, will that institution support your wishes or do you have to be moved usually to your home? So those are the variables. So um, let me give you some examples and I'll show you how the team will differ. The first example is uh, I'm, I've, I'm one of these people that lives in a completed life. I'm gonna end my life like the woman that Stan Cited who chose to end her life two weeks before she was 80. Um, you can do that with inert gas with no help at all. You don't need a team. You got that? You can do this on your own. Now, I'm not recommending that. If you're choosing that as a method to die, you should take advantage of it. You should plan your death. You should have your family around. You should maybe even have a party and you say goodbyes. But to actually end your life with inert gas, you don't need any help. In fact, if they help you, they may be exposing themselves to criminal liability. If your choice is to die by VSED, then you certainly need a team. Now, that team probably should be members of your family that are taking care of you because more than likely you're at home. And it should certainly include somebody with medical experience who can take care of the medical needs that are minor but important uh, when you choose stopping eating and drinking. Stan has himself on several occasions chosen stopping eating and drinking and gone many days. I think the max was five, wasn't it, Stan? That's uh, correct. Yes, Bill. And then the advantage of VSED is you can change your mind. Stan obviously changed his mind. I mean, he never intended to finish it. Uh, he was just showing people VSED is a good way to go. Um, so there's two examples. Now let's, let's go with the other extreme where people are ill. People are seriously ill. So for my third example, this person has cancer and the treatments have failed. And they choose to have a hospice team. So there is a team in itself. And so you're getting a whole team just by choosing a good hospice. Be sure to ask your hospice a lot of questions before you sign up. If you're dying via the End of Life Option Act, for whatever reason, then your team is set by law. You've got to have two physicians, you got to have a pharmacist willing to write the prescription. And frankly, you should also have somebody with medical experience at the time of ingestion. And again, if you're choosing to die by the End of Life Option Act, you should have your family around to participate in your last act and make it the best ending possible. You should have a a good ending. It's your life. Why go out in misery and pain? That's one issue to look at. That kind of goes back to my first subject. 
So that's that's it. Now, another way to look at a team is to hire a doctor who's got the team and he's specific and will spend time with you uh, to sort things out and work with your family. And there is such a doctor. There are several doctors, I think, here in San Diego. But the leading doctor is Dr. Bob Uslander, one of whose members, he's got a new physician on his staff now who's on this website, who's on this Zoom, uh, Donald Moore. Welcome, Donald. Uh, so there is a whole team when you, you get Dr. Bob on your team. Now, remember, he's not in the medical system. You pay him. Medicare does not pay him. So remember that. So Dr. Bob has a ancillary operation where he can uh, use a charity to help pay for his fees for people that can't afford to pay his fees. There's another doctor um, who's also available uh, that has this broad concept. Um, I can't seem to find her name right now. Oh, here it is. Um, Dr. Fiona Dank Danke, D A N Q U E. She's associated with a pre hospice, but she also seems to do work on her own. And I think she operates somewhat in a manner as Dr. Bob. So that's it. I've given you examples. So I'm really looking forward to the questions. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, so uh, we're now going to begin reading the audience's questions and answers. Janet Hager and Christy Golem, treasurer and vice president, respectively, of the Hemlock Society of San Diego, will read your questions to our panelists. <laughs> so the next question, just going in line, is that came from Richard Stewart, and this is to Stan, and he's just asking if you can please supply the citations for all the articles that you mentioned. Um, well, that will be uh, at the end, uh, but very simply, tinyurl.com slash Termin Dementia Articles. And the next question comes from Kathy Duke, also to you, Stan, about, and this kind of goes together, about how do we get the cards that you demonstrated? Um, the, the, cards are avail the cards are available only online with very uh, limited exceptions. Uh, so it's an online computer program, and it's you go on to caringadvocates.org, make it a, a contribution. You get a, a personal link and a passcode, and you can go and you can go through the cards, stop, start, come back again the next day, the next week, revise it as you go along, and then when you get to the end of the process, if you want, you can go to the next level of uh, interaction and speak with me about how consistent are they and then we can make a recording which generally lasts about an hour which becomes your video testimony for your living will which is designed to be persuasive i would just like to add to that the go wish cards are free online as well uh, and you can play a game with yourself or with others uh, with the go wish cards i like stan's cards I like the cartoons on the back of everything he's done, uh, but I just want to point out there there is another set of cards that are available. I think there are two different uh, goals. Go wish is wonderful to kind of find out what it is that you want at the end of life. What are your wishes? To so just kind of start talking about it. My way cards get to the point of deciding when. Okay. So the next question, um, it came from Jason Blum Bloomberg, and he's wondering if each of the speakers could offer up some factors to consider for a terminal cancer patient who's struggling with the decision to engage in medical aid and dying. Well, I would start off by saying that uh, I disagree with Bill that it's your decision and your decision only because your decision affects the people who love you. And my brief answer is when the when your suffering becomes so severe that you cannot enjoy any pleasure in life anymore, and that's the time to say goodbye. And just one other thing, and that is if you're not if you don't have medical aid in dying for any reason um 
they, they said is a good option. And the reason that I fasted twice back in 2006 and 2007 was to find out what agents can control thirst and other symptoms as you undergo medical dehydration to make it as peaceful as possible. Gabby, you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you. For medical aid in dying, I think, um, you know, I think it gets to the point where at what point are you, is your suffering taking over? Is the pain too extreme? Is the projection of where this is going to extreme. And I think one of the things that I have witnessed in, in when someone makes this decision, when someone chooses to exercise their legal right to do this, is to, to, to be able to have sort of the last word, to be able to say, to make a choice. Because when you are given a diagnosis, your autonomy and voice is taken from you, right? Because you don't have much choice now, right? You're, you've been given this diagnosis, it's the end of your life. To be able to say, at the very least, I want to die with dignity. At the very least, I want it to be on my terms. And I want it to be done in such a way that, yes, there is a team that is there with you to make sure that everything is done appropriately. And that if something should go wrong, that there is a, a skilled and educated team there to help you. But mostly to be able to say, look, I'm done. I'm done suffering. My quality of life is slowly diminishing. I'm ready to say goodbye on my terms. And what I have seen almost every time, and I've done it again, like I said, seven 75 to 100 times. And out of that, there's only been two that there was a, a little glitch in it, but almost everyone had the opportunity to get the people they love around them, if that was their choice, have them present, say goodbye, take the medications and die with peace and ease and grace, which I think every human deserves. And I think that's the part of this that people struggle with because many people, there's obviously some, there's some, negative connotations towards it. There's a different opinion and everyone's entitled to have that. But at the end of the day, if you are a person who is suffering with a terminal diagnosis and, and you are going to die, to be able to make the choice to do it with compassion and kindness and love surrounding you is, is in my opinion, a true gift when, when everything else has been taken from you. So I think it's important that you, um, it's based on what I guess the answer would be is it's based on, for me, is when their suffering has become too great, when the quality of life has diminished and when they don't want to spend how much time left, whether it's days or weeks, burdening their family, because sometimes that's one of their reasons for doing it. But most of all, and, and most importantly, is to be able to have their wishes honored and to die with some dignity, compassion and kindness. I Thank agree. You. Go ahead, Bill. No, I was just thinking I agree with everything she just said. That's wonderful. And, and so do I. And so well said. Thank you. Okay, then we've got another question. Um, could we please get, uh, this is from Nancy Stern. Can we please get Dr. Terman's two bullet points about the new Pulsed? He mentioned them at the very end. Um, Right. Uh, when I sit down with someone and it takes a few hours to do advanced care planning, they not only complete a living will, and they not only complete uh, a proxy agent uh, and form a decision committee, but they also complete not one, but usually six, sometimes even more, pulses. One pulse becomes immediately active the others are put into a registry where the proxy agent has the uh, authority to take a post that has been stored and go to the physician who's treating and say, this one seems more appropriate in terms of its orders by the patient decision committee. Would you consider doctor implementing these orders and, and voiding out the orders on the previous post? Does that answer your question as to how it works? Um, um, sure. I, I want to make clear, I think, as best of my knowledge, the pulse hasn't been changed in several years. The pink pulse 
form in California hasn't been changed. Stan's got a process of using several posts, P-O-L-S-T posts, uh, and that's his system. He's got a very unique system. And if you start with Stan, you will learn all the details of his system. But there's only one pulse form. That I understood. What I didn't understand was on the slide, there were two bullet points of things that should go into the post. Oh, those very important things those are two these. Things okay. was on the slide. Or I wasn't sure I had to answer your question. Thank you. Adding to every post that is completed, I highly recommend two additional orders. The and one is implemented orders must be consistent with my living will. Second, no one but the patient can sign and consent to a new post. Those are very strategically important additions. And the way I worked my presentation is they would have uh, overcome what went wrong with that 84 year old woman who had dementia. The uh, the next question comes from Karen Stewart, and she's wondering if any of the panel members have had experience with a client or a patient who went to Switzerland to end their life. I haven't. I haven't. I haven't. Okay. Christy. <laughs> we agreed. We all agreed. <laughs> but Christy right here has. I, I did answer that say in a couple of the chat yeah. things that so anybody that wants to can go on Hemlock's website and there's two videos of me describing taking my mother to Switzerland uh, and she had Alzheimer's. Thank you. Um, another question came from Maya Calloway. Um, and it's sort of a comment and question. She, she says that, you know, compassion and choices is continuing to become larger and more powerful. They really seem to be dictating the rules of dying with dignity in the U.S. When are we going to actually be able to push a more compassionate law? <laughs> I'll, I'll answer that since it's a legal question. I'm sure others will have an answer, too. Uh, compassion and choices has done a magnificent job of promoting uh, death and dignity laws, i.e. California's End of Life Option Act around the country. That's why we have nine jurisdictions now that have these laws, over a third of the US population. Or well, maybe it's over a quarter, I think that's the quarter. Um, but compassion and choices really doesn't have any real control over what happens in the states. It's up to the legislatures, or if they go to initiative, it's up to the people. Uh, compassion and choices does have a limitation that bothers me and maybe other people. It doesn't want to talk about uh, other options to end life. It's not, it just won't acknowledge that uh, inert gas is a possible way of exiting this world. Uh, for a while, Early on, it wouldn't even talk about voluntary stopping eating and drinking, but it has taken that on and is promoting VSED now. Uh, but uh, it has no power to change any of these laws. Uh, it's, its capability is working in legislative situations where they know how to do the best to get these laws passed. And they're working constantly every year in five or eight different jurisdictions. Uh, one of the uh, advanced directives for dementia, which I reviewed, was authored by people at uh, Compassion and Choices. And I have some very severe criticisms of it, which are in the paper that you can access uh, for free. Uh, so if you want, if you're considering their advanced directive or any other, there's uh, uh, there, about two dozen were considered. 
We will have a program from Final Exit Network who does recommend the inert gas method. I think it's July 16th. <clears throat> Thank you, Faye. The, there was a question from Jason Bloomberg um, wondering if, uh, Stan, if you could repeat the members of a hospice team. I think it was actually Gabby who may have brought those up, but. I can answer that if you'd like, uh, Dr. Sure. Turner. Um, the hospice team consists of a medical director who will most, I mean, will be completely involved in your case. You may or may not see them depending on your system management and what's going on with your, your diagnosis, but they are always there for us as nurses to go to for assistance with orders and progress with the diagnosis and disease process. You'll have a case manager, which is your main point of contact. You'll see them once a week, more if needed. If that case manager cannot be there, then there is always a visiting nurse that can come. And it's usually once a week, but again, based on whatever it is you're, you're experiencing, more time will be needed, then you can have daily visits. We will do daily visits for transitioning to actively dying um, and, and also for change in condition and, and to manage symptoms. You have a social worker and the social worker in, is one of the ones that are most mis- um, I don't think they just don't, people just don't realize just how valuable they are. The social worker can help with things like understanding your insurance and what is available to you. Sometimes insurances can cover things like caregivers and respite care. They could, the social worker can also help with funeral plans. Um, if you're needing to miss work or your children are missing school, they can write, get a letter written by the doctor to give you a, a letter that says that you are taking care of an ill parent or relative. They also help with finding caregivers and um, support as well as emotional support. The spiritual, the chaplain is also there for you. Now the chaplain, isn't necessarily coming always from a religious standpoint. It's also very much spiritual. People who have a strong faith usually come to this with the idea of where they're going and, and have a higher power that is supporting them. People who do not have a strong faith tend to have more questions and curiosities and uncertainties at the end of the life. The chaplain doesn't necessarily come from a religious standpoint. They come from a perspective of they are a very safe place to listen and talk. And they really bring a, a, a beautiful presence to all the questions and curiosities that happen at the end of life. Your home health aide can come and do showering and bathing, whether in the shower or in the bed, both of which are beautiful. They can do this one to three, sometimes more, depending on the needs time a week. You also have a hospice volunteer. The hospice volunteer is trained incredibly beautifully. And, and from my perspective as an end of life doula are very much like a doula in that they bring a, a beautiful sense of compassion and companionship at the bedside. And they too can spend a little more time. Almost everyone is once a week, depending on what your needs are. Hospice does not provide caregivers, which is definitely a misconception, but social workers can help with finding that for you. I hope that was helpful. And I'll add one more thing is if you choose to use an end of life doula, that is not a part of the Medicare benefit. It is not something that hospice provides. Some hospices train their hospice volunteers as doulas, which is one of the things I do. I train volunteers to be doulas, but they are out of pocket. They are separate from the hospice benefit, but it's a beautiful, um, add to the team in, in that's caring for you and your loved one in a way that um, can fill the gaps. And, and I understand that not all hospices do this. I'm, I'm speaking from the hospice that I work for. So I'm just telling you what we do and how I do things and how I'd like to see them done. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that it is important to know that you do have a team of resources. And I always tell people that hospice is not the boss of you. You need to ask questions. And if you're not happy with the person that is attending to you, or you're not happy with the information that you've been given or not given, you need to advocate for yourself and for your family members and ask questions. Hospice is not the boss of you. So, so just Gabby, a sort of a follow-up because two questions have come in simultaneously mm -hmm. um, asking about, do you know three tips to find a good hospice? Or, and then the other question is, are there, good, are there guidelines for interviewing hospices? 
Yes. So I just gave this advice to a doula client the other day. She said, which hospice do I use? Now, I'm not just going to refer the hospice I work for because I don't want to take responsibility for that. But I, I, what I always tell them is you call them and talk to them. If they come from you, come to you with a compassionate heart, right? It's not coming from a, a protocol business professional side, but they actually are, are coming from a heart centered perspective. That's the one I'd want. You know, if, if they listen to you and they hear what's going on, if they ask about what your family members need, what does your mom need? Where is she at right now? What is it that you need from us? Because some hospices, I'm not saying any names, but some hospices come from the perspective as we'll get you on, we'll do this, but that's not necessarily what happens. So I, I always advise families to, to call at least three and tell them what you need what you're expecting, what you hope for the person that you love will receive, because you deserve that. And, and I work for a nonprofit. And, and while I think that I personally would choose a nonprofit, I, I tend to think it's about the person you talk to, not necessarily the company they work for. So talk to them, ask them the questions that matter most to you, tell them what you need for your loved one, and ask them how they would address it. Uh, when it comes to the questions for hospice, uh, I have a list. If you want to contact me, my email will show up at the end and I can send you my list of questions. Did you have another question to add to that one, Janet? Uh, yes. So, along these same lines, any kind of red flags to not hire a particular hospice? You know what? I don't think people see the red flags until they they have the service happening. You know, I think if if they're not answering their phones in a timely fashion, if they can't be there, you know, you can't promise we'll be there in an hour. Sometimes that's not realistic and that's hard. It's hard for hospices to, to do that. And I get that. I think if they are not consistent, if they don't, okay, here's what I would want. I want the person to come in who's seen me to turn their phone off and to be fully present. And to sit with me, look at me and say, how can I help you and what do you need? Now, as a hospice nurse, when I am at your bedside, I will never leave if I haven't left you with some sort of tip or education or some sort of information that these removes some of your fear and leaves you feeling a little more confident at the bedside. That's our job. Because at the end of the day, we're not going to be with you 24-7. So I want you to have the tools. I want you to have everything I can possibly give you so that when I walk out the door, you know what to do. And you feel less fear about medications or the dying process or the things like the death rattle, which is scary. This person is dying. They deserve to be treated like human beings with kindness and compassion. And your hospice team, whoever you hire should offer you that. I feel a little soapboxy right now, but that's my passion. Well, if you're dying because you choose to die, you've got to make sure you've got to ask the question, will that particular hospice support you? Say you choose VSED, will they support you with VSED? Because some won't. Well, some doctors don't support it. Some nurses don't support it. In my hospice, I'm one of the ones that have attended most of them because I do obviously but you're absolutely right Bill I think if this is your direction and you already know that that should be the first question you ask it should be on their website by yeah way. absolutely well that's law now yes yeah, right. <laughs> it isn't <laughs> they're not doing it like it. Um, okay so I have another question here uh this one is from Evie Kosor, does the natural dying living will need a lawyer? It does not need a lawyer. Um, I, over the two decades that I've been working on this uh, protocol and strategic advanced care planning, I've consulted with about five attorneys, um, uh, some of them quite prominent. And uh, and so a lot of legal information has been put into uh, that document, plus the uh, companion document, which is called the Natural Dying Agreement and Summary Affidavit, um, which you would swear before a juror is true and complete so that it can then be submitted to a court of law. So you don't have to go to law 
to a court to get what you wanted. So I, there's a lot of, uh, my program has a lot of legal um, interventions interweave with medical interventions. Um, and then we have legal people we can consult if we get stuck and uh, have a question that needs to be answered. I'd like to answer the question a little more directly. The answer is no, you don't need a lawyer. You can get advanced directive forms off the internet. Stan has one, I have one, everybody has one. Uh, the question is really whether that form meets your needs. There is one requirement, one legal requirement. Otherwise, you write what you want. And that legal requirement is your advanced directive has to be executed in the manner required by the state in which you live. In California, that's a, a, either a notarization or two witnesses, uh, two witnesses that aren't connected with you. There's a lot of verbiage connected with that. But if you just get two friends or two people across the street, uh, those two witnesses are okay. If the witnesses cannot be your medical providers or people uh, connected with the facility in which you're living. So I, I, I criticize lawyers, frankly, for the way they write advanced directives. They're six, seven pages long. They think a lawyer, they think a doctor in an emergency room is going to read those. I don't think so. That's, again, a very good reason why you don't depend upon advanced directives to get your wishes fulfilled. You instead depend upon future pulse, one page. That's all it is. And with some states too, and um, I am now associated with people so that we can help people, 37% uh, of the population. We have about um, seven states uh, uh, where we can offer future posts which is uh, the most strategically powerful vehicle to use to get your wishes. But remember, even though you're using a pulse, one of those two bullet points is implemented orders on this pulse must be consistent with my advanced directive. And your advanced directive needs to be good, specific, clear, and convincing, and comprehensive. Well, while Stan has a, a very complicated and comprehensive plan, the key to getting your wishes carried out is a strong agent, an agent who understands your wishes and will speak up for you and go to bat for you in an aggressive way when needed. The two are not mutually exclusive, and we have the bilateral contract where the agent agrees to be your ardent advocate to get providers to honor your wishes. We agree on that, Bill. So to take a little bit different turn here, um, Pat Garrett asks, is VSAD voluntarily stop, stopping eating and drinking painful? Well, I can give you from personal experience uh, times two, it was not. Uh, the first day I was a little hungry and then ketogenesis uh, popped in or a different way of uh, metabolizing fats, which produces compounds that naturally reduce hunger. Uh, the main issue was dryness. The main place was in the mouth. And I have a series of agents called thirst reducing aid in a kit. And I used to send them out, buy them and send them out. Now I just order them from a Amazon and I send it directly to the person who wants to be said. And with the appropriate care, the team at the bedside uh, doesn't have to be a, a nurse. And these are all over the counter. Um, he said can be uh, very peaceful. Uh, and I go back to uh, what inspired me, who, who was uh, Linda, Linda Danzini, 2003, New England Journal of Medicine, who did a, a survey with alert patients and asked them uh, a, and observed with a questionnaire, a survey by the nurses, how peaceful the process was. And it turns out it even was more peaceful than voluntary, than uh, uh, physician assisted dying. And no reason was given. But imagine this. One morning you wake up and you say, I think I'm done. It's time for me to transition. 
So I'll skip breakfast. A little a few hours later, you skip lunch. A few hours later, you skip dinner. The next day, you continue the process. And you know that for the first five days, as I'm here to test, be a witness to it, uh, as an example, you can change your mind. On the other hand, if you are going to Switzerland, for example, or Canada, or whatever, and you, they say, here is a, or yeah, California, you, here is a vial, uh, a little glass, it contains enough poison in it so that as soon as you drink it, within moments, you're going to be asleep and then you're going to die. Whoa, that's a pretty awesome decision to make. So there are lots of reasons, and I'm not the place for it. Why I would argue VSED is better than MAID, but it's good for both. Uh, I mean, it, some people prefer one, some the other. Um, you need to know what the arguments are, pros and cons from someone who has experience with it. And uh, you can ask Gabby, for example, about MAID. You can ask me about VSED, and you can ask Faye about anything. So many people are not eligible for MAID and medical aid. That's right. That they uh, use VSET as an alternative and also the inhalation of inert gas. The, the, our law is very restrictive, and so you have to be terminal within six months, and you have to be mentally competent. So many people don't meet those eligibility requirements, and they have to resort to not eating and drinking, which to me would be very difficult. I'm hungry right now. <laughs> Gabby, can you can you tell us what you've experienced at the bedside? What is experienced relative to to uh, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking? Well, so I I'm not a big fan of that. So you probably don't want to hear my thoughts on it. I have witnessed people struggling. I think it's really important to have a doctor present because it, it is hard and to have them at least guide and support you on that decision. Um, I have just it's. I, it's not from what I have witnessed, it's not as um, as easy or peaceful as you would like it to be coming from the perspective of medical aid and dying. Um, the reason, especially now they've just introduced um, phenobarbital to the combination combination. And when it first started, I think so I've, I've been doing it since 2015 and um, it took the longest was 16 hours. Now I've done I did three last week and they were all less than 30 minutes. So, and the, the death itself is peaceful, it's guided, it's supported, um, and that's the route I would choose to go personally. So what I have witnessed is just the struggle. I mean, I'm with you, Faye, I'm always hungry. There's no way I could skip one meal, let alone five days worth of food. So if you, that is a choice you're gonna do, I think it's really important that you have the, a supportive team there that can help you physically. If you're eligible. Oh. If you're eligible. Yeah, that's the thing. So I prescribe uh, sedatives so that the first day or so where you may be hungry, uh, pass easily, mostly asleep, and then natural uh, uh, ketogenesis kicks in. And then, as V said, continues, you go to sleep a little bit, then a lot, then you enter a coma, and finally you pass on. So um, it's a rather peaceful progression. Uh, so it's almost I've like it by the bedside. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. It's almost like palliative sedation in the way that you get to that sedative space so that your body could succumb to what it was doing anyway, but right. a little more peacefully. In that regard, I'd probably do it. You need to have a physician on board who's willing to prescribe medications to help you with the initial suffering if you have it. But there's some patients don't need it. They say, I didn't need it. I didn't need any sedatives. And, uh, my, and, and I'll, I'll just chime in because I'm supporting actually three people, three people right now on VZ, and most people don't need sedatives for that first period. That's and right, the vast majority of the time, it is a very peaceful, non painful way to go. Thank you. Second opinion. Good. And my son brought in a pepperoni pizza, and I said, <laughs> I don't care. I am not hungry. I am not interested, you know, because I mean, it's lot. I wouldn't say this for everyone, but I can tell you my personal experience. It ain't that hard. How many days did you do it for, Stan? Three? Four days and then Four five days. days. And usually takes nine to 14 days to die? That's correct. So? But the last day. <laughs> the vast majority of people are in a, 
the coma. I'm surprised Stanley is actually here talking to us because by the, <laughs> the fifth day, the vast majority of people have lapsed into some sort of comatose or delirium state. So, and cannot go to the bathroom themselves and need need home health care or some kind of care. Big deal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No <laughs> but Dr. Stanley, um, from your cartoons, there was that sign that says, no, you can't change your mind. This is what you picked out. And so therefore you have to continue on. So this is only really for people who this is only for people who have had two determinations that they lack capacity such as patients in the advanced stage of dementia. It's three o'clock and our, our uh, meeting is officially ending, um, but our panelists may be willing to stay around a little later to answer a few questions. But before they do, uh, we have to take care of just a little business. And I'll share with the audience the uh, bio biographical information that was provided us by each of our three speakers. And uh, so that anybody who wants to get in touch with them can, in fact, uh, do exactly that. That's fine. It doesn't give my Gmail address, D-R-T-E-R-M-A-N at gmail.com. And my phone number, which is 800-64-PEACE. Or text me at 760-704-7524. Okay. That's... Dr. Stanley Terman, and uh, I guess you could probably find a lot of what you need just by going to the the uh, web address that he's got here. Uh, CaringAdvocates.org, that would be the better one. Okay, um, and then uh, our second speaker was Gabrielle, and Gabrielle uh, has her, can people see her? information here now yes okay. is a hospice heart hospice with which she's affiliated yes i'm the i have the facebook and website the hospice heart i never heard of that huh. it has 135,000 people beautiful community really wow and i noticed in one of the in the chat that several people were here from that so i just want to say thank you so much for being here and is there a residential component of that? Uh, what does that mean? Is there a place where people can go as opposed? Oh, to absolutely. Know. So the Hospice Heart is a Facebook page. And then I also have my website, which is indicated here, the hospiceheart.net. And if you go there, everything's there. My books, my um, blogs I write. So I have a lot of blogs and poems, but there's also a lot of really wonderful podcasts and interviews that are on there and all my classes. And there's a link to the Facebook page. But the hospice heart is not the name of a hospice. No, the hospice oh, okay. heart is me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, and now, last but not least, of course, is Bill Simmons. And Bill's information should be on the screen if I've done this correctly. Bill, do you want to say anything while the, your screen is showing? Um, yes, uh, I'm doing my series of three lectures in Rancho Bernardo this summer. Um, there's a new facility that uh, Oasis has that hasn't been opened yet. And my dates are, I think, the 15th, 17th, and 19th of July in RB. You can't find the class on the website yet uh, because they haven't uh, put it up for uh, Rancho Bernardo. So that won't be till another couple of weeks to be able to sign up for my three lectures, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And that's open to the public, right? Yes, it's very much open to the public. It does cost a few dollars, but it's very, very inexpensive. Okay. Well, since our meeting is formally over, do we have more questions, Janet? Um, do any of the MADE methods allow for organ donation? Oh, sorry. I'm hoping that organ donation is all you, that you're always available for organ donation, no matter how you die. Do you think that's wrong? 
No, I, I think I'm I'm sure that you can donate your organs if you do me. Yes. Um, and so. then um another question was from Giselle, and she's wondering what exactly are the oral agents for dry mouth that you can order from Amazon if you do V said. There are 10 of them, and I don't remember them offhand. Um, it does change regarding uh, availability. Sprays, a glycerin-coated Q-tips, which are flavored with lemon, are two of the most important. Um, Biotene is a popular manufacturer for uh, disorders of drying like Sojin's disease, and um, Oasis is another one. Um, and um, you can write to me and I can tell you what the list is if you like. D-R-T-E-R-M-A-N at gmail.com. Okay. Thank you. Is Donnie with us still? Donnie might want to uh, chip in on that question. Yeah, uh, those are all, I'd, also, I'd recommend all of those. And in addition, um, Oils like olive oil, uh, coconut oil can be really nice in the lips to help help moisten things. Um, but and yeah, you mentioned the swabs, right, Stanley? Yeah. So yeah, I think you covered all the big oh, ones. Good. Also, there's a very delightful spray with rose hips, which you just do for your whole face. It just makes you feel good. Question that came in from Pamela Harper asking: Have the future pulse been tested in court? Uh, the post, uh, the future post is a post. So um, then the question would then be, have the posts been tested in court? And I guess if I haven't heard about it, it may not have happened because I follow the, what goes on with posts very carefully. Uh, but you know what? That's a negative result is never definitive. I will ask um, two people who might also know three, Carl Steinberg, Thaddeus Pope, and uh, Fred Meraki. And if we have three or four negative results, then we can say probably never tested in court. Except one time in 2010 in the state of New York, it wasn't the pulse that was tested. It was what would happen with the patient. It's a very interesting case of a person who had advanced dementia named Zornow. So it's the, the case is in RE, the matter of Zornow, Z-O-R-N-O-W, 2010, New York State. And we have a Catholic family with about six children. One daughter says she wants a feeding tube. The other five said she would never want a feeding tube. It went in front of a very strange judge named Polito, who incorporated troves of Catholic documents into his uh, uh, ruling and sided with the daughter. So that poor woman had to endure another few years of, of, uh, of agony. Uh, but here's the point, which is really telling and is heuristic, and I'm glad you asked the question. If you want to avoid a post, you got to go to court. And you, who oppose the post, have the burden of proof. That's what that one case would lead me to believe. Although I'm not an attorney, so I have a caveat on that, but that's my take on it. Well, thank you very much, Stan, for uh, that insight as well as all the others. And thank you, Bill and Gabby. Uh, you've all been very, very uh, insightful and i'm sure we've all learned a lot just by listening to you today i see faith uh, raising your hand i just want to say two things that i sort of learned from tad pope that is it's a good idea to have a directive that says if i um don't want to eat and drink and i'm no longer capable of making that decision my loved ones can take me out of wherever i am if they won't follow the order and stop feeding me and hydrating me. A lot of people do that uh, when the institution will not uh, abide by the person's directive. And that Pope suggests that's not quite legal, that uh, the family could get in trouble unless there was a written statement from the person when, when they were capable of 
uh, that's what their wishes are. The other thing that Tad Pope suggests too is if you if your family is taking you to Switzerland to die, it's a good idea to have a directive uh, statement from yourself saying, I want this to happen, that my family is uh, uh, doing this according to my wishes, because neither one of these have been litigated, I don't think. And it's a good idea, were they to be litigated, to have some word from you that this is your wish. Bill, I'm speaking out of turn, not being a lawyer, yeah. but... Uh, that's okay. It was an interesting piece of information. Thanks for adding that, Faye. Uh, I guess uh, this concludes our, our meeting. And uh, again, thanks to our guests. Thanks to our participants. Uh, and thanks uh, to uh, Lee for putting the program together. She did a great job. And, and uh, we will hopefully see you at the next meeting on Final Exit Network, all of you. Um, and if you haven't joined Hemlock Society of San Diego, think about it. We need your support. Okay. 